Hi, thank you so much for coming and making this a successful evening. Uh, we are excited to talk about prevention and treatment of diseases like, like cancer with the help of nutrition together with conventional therapy. And um, I'm Preeti Bansal Sagar, Regional Manager Midwest for Plant, for Plant Pure Nation. And I'm also group leader here for the Greater Cincinnati Plant Pure Nation group. Um, I, I heartily th thank my co-group leaders, um, Chris Christensen, who is sitting at the back at the, here at the sign-up table, and Richard Brown, our media person, uh, without whose help it would not have been possible to make this day successful. I welcome Dr. Rekha Chaudhary, neuro-oncologist with the University of Cincinnati Brain Tumor Center. She is a pioneer in the field of using dietary and lifestyle interventions together with conventional treatment to get best possible results for her patients. We are grateful that she has taken time to give us this talk today on the importance of nutrition and lifestyle changes to have better outcomes for treacherous diseases like cancer. I, I thank Laura Dietrich, Plant Pure Nation Jumpstart Director, and Katya Trent, Plant Pure Nation Pots Director, for driving down from Kentucky and supporting the Greater Cincinnati Group. And I also very much thank the Center for Spiritual Living and Reverend D. Coy, who have provided the space for us free of charge. We'll start with watching a short blurb on the Plant Pure Nation movie and the movie coming to Cincinnati. Thank you so much, Katya. Now we will watch a short blurb on the movie coming to the University of Cincinnati. IRB approval to scientifically study the data from Nelson's jumpstart to the movie. excited about new things happening here for UC. With this, I invite Dr. Chaudhary to the podium. Let's all give her a big hand. Thank you so much, Dr. Chaudhary. I uh, normally don't need a microphone, but I'm a little under the weather today, so I am going to use the microphone. Um, if I get too loud, I tend to be too loud. Um, that was a, a great visit for the Plant Pure Nation um, film crew to our institution. We were the first medical school to show it. And like, you, like it said, 200 students. And, and you, some of the background knowledge is that Dr. Barrett's wife is in there. So Dr. Barrett, you know, the head of the University of Cincinnati Cancer Institute. Um, there's a lot of prominent faces in there that this is the first time they were hearing about it. So that was really, really, really exciting. I was just telling Laura, I was like, they kept showing my butt though, because they wanted to show the whole, they wanted to show everything. And I'm like, oh, would you stop showing my butt? Okay, so I made them take a, bu a bunch, bunch of those scenes out. So um, my topic today is preventing cancer with healthy living, a scientific discussion. So keep calm, it's only a tumor. I think this is what some people hear when they're given the diagnosis of a tumor. <clears throat> I started, I grew up in Cambridge, Ohio, and then I trained here at University of Cincinnati, and then um, did my training at Carmanos in Detroit, and then moved to Toledo, that's where my husband's from. And while I was in Toledo, I did mainly a lung cancer, and I also did a lot of hematology. So when I did lung cancer, it was really easy for me emotionally because, you know, these are 60-year-old male smokers and it was easy for me because I wasn't them. So I moved to Cincinnati and I started doing brain tumors. Um, I took up all of neuro-oncology and most of my practice, a lot of my practice is brain tumors. And all of a sudden I was meeting patients who had never done anything in their life. They had not smoked, you know, they lived this perfect life and they had a brain tumor. And I was, I became anxiety prone. I mean, my husband was like, I, my husband has $8 million in life insurance. And I was so scared. 
I wouldn't leave the house without checking all the water. Isn't that a weird thing? I would like make sure that all the faucets, and I was so anxious that something was suddenly gonna happen to me because I was seeing all these patients. And then I saw a movie, Forks Over Knives. How many in here have seen the movie Forks Over Knives, right? So I'm preaching to the choir. So literally, um, and so I saw that movie and I was like, what, what, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can change cancer outcomes with food? I mean, this was just a recent discovery for me. And I was like, no, 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 wait a minute. So I watched the movie again and I thought, that's crazy. So I read the China study and then I started reading more and more books and I thought, this is insane. I mean, this data, why haven't I, why haven't I ever seen it before? And it gave me a sense of satisfaction, something that I can do to help my patients and help me live life to its fullest. So that's where I started to come. I came from a place of fear um, and to now where, where I'm gonna take you through my journey, okay? So, I think for people, there's a difference, a very hard difference between curing and healing, okay? Curing is an external process that removes all evidence of disease. It's what physicians do. It's usually on a physical level. For instance, you break your arm. My husband's an orthopedic surgeon. He'll set it or maybe do surgery on it, okay? But healing is an internal process through which a person becomes whole. It's what patients do. It's on a physical, emotional, and spiritual level. So that you may take rest. You may go to physical therapy. You might not do your regular stressful activities during that time. You may eat healthier to help that, to help that arm to heal. But that's something that you can do as a patient so that one can participate in the fight for life with cancer by working to enhance your own healing is a profoundly important discovery for many people. And I don't think many, many people know that, that you can work to prevent cancer and you can work to cure cancer, okay? So you can fit a million cancer cells on the head of a pin. This is the head of a pin. You can fit a million cancer cells. So by the time we can see it, it is much more than a million cancer cells. This is a picture of a cancer cell being attacked by our immune system. And these are called natural killer cells. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is called the kiss of death. And so sometimes people think, oh, I'm gonna eat right and exercise, and it'll make me feel better while I'm getting my cancer treatment, or it'll make me feel better so I don't get cancer, right? But what they don't realize is that these changes that you're making through diet through exercise, through stress, are happening on a molecular level, on a cellular level even. I'm part of a new movement in medicine. It's called integrative medicine. It used to be called complementary or alternative medicine, but we didn't like that title because alternative medicine implies that it's in, it's in lieu of traditional medical therapy. And what I'm here to say is I believe in chemotherapy. I believe in radiation therapy. I believe in surgery. I think those things work but we need to integrate other approaches into our therapy. Now, the problem with integrative medicine is, I don't think there's one physician here today, correct, right? There's not one physician here today. Most physicians have difficulty accepting this. Why? Why do they have trouble accepting yoga, right? They have trouble accepting yoga, oh, they have trouble accepting yoga and things like that because there are very few trials, clinical trials, that they think or they have heard of or that they've read, okay? So in oncology, prospective, randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trials are the gold standard. If you take drug A and you put it in a double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial, then at that point, oncologists will say, yes, this is the better drug. But that's hard to do with diet, right? How do, you, how do I take you, one, half the people, and say, I'm gonna put you on this diet, and half the people I'm not, and then hope for the best, right? I mean, you have to follow them out 10 years, there's a lot of money, there's not a lot of money in funding these trials, the trials are millions of dollars. So what I'm going to do, but what we do know is that 50% of cancer patients are using alternative medicine, and, or what we used to be called CAM, now is integrated medicine, and look at how many, 15% of those are using diet. Right? So we need to know that as, about this as physicians. We need to take this field forward. But the only way to take this field forward is to talk about it in a scientific way. 
If we don't talk about it in a scientific way, we're gonna be continued to be scoffed at by the medical profession. Okay, so that's the only way to move forward. So again, the problems with integrated medicine are the lack of randomized control data, non-acceptance and fear from MDs because they're scared you're just gonna give up your blood pressure medicine. You're gonna give up this, right? You're, gonna, you're not gonna give up your blood pressure medicine. You're gonna do this in conjunction with your blood pressure medicine. Small studies, lack of funding compared to pharmaceutical funding, and the most important thing is that the interventions are often subjective. So how do you measure stress? How do you measure depression? You know, it's much easier to measure a tumor size on a CAT scan than it is to measure somebody's quality of life, for instance, okay? So these are the, de this is the problems that I'm dealing with in, in discussing this with my colleagues. So I'm gonna take you through a little bit of a science lesson today because I have to take it through, I have to take you through this. So this is a randomized double, oh, uh oh, oh no, okay. A randomized controlled double blinded trial, okay? So the physician and the patient are blinded to the intervention and the patients, okay, are randomized by a computer program to a treatment group and a control group and then they're followed up and then we compare the results, okay? So this is an oncology randomized clinical trial. This is, an evident, this is called a Kaplan-Meier curve. And what you see right here is you have surgery on the top line, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and palliative care. So in this case, surgery is the best arm, okay? Because the, what we're looking for on this curve is we're looking at the space between the curves, okay? We're looking at the space between the curves. And that's the most important part of this. I want to remember, you're gonna, I'm going to quiz you on this later on. P-value of less than 0.05 is statistically significant. Okay. What that means is that this, if some, something is less than 0 0.05, it didn't just happen by chance. So if you go to the casino in Vegas and you come home with $1,000 more than you started out with, that happened by chance. Okay, the, what we have to say is that this intervention, 95 times out of 100, would produce the same results. That's a simplification of the p-value, but that's basically what it says. Okay, so most trials with diet, unfortunately, are prospective cohort trial. We take healthy people, we see how they eat, and then 30 years later, we look at them and see what happens. That was the China study, um, various other trials. Again, oncologists will not accept this, okay? They'll say, and physicians, cardiologists, they'll say, well, those people were healthier anyway. Those people exercise. People that tend to eat a plant-based diet tend to exercise. People that eat a plant-based diet tend to go to church. So that, that's why they were healthier. Right, so again, there's problems with this, but we'll address this, we'll, we'll address this and I'll, and I'll talk about it. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about diet, but we're gonna talk about all avenues of, of prevention. So the first one is stress reduction, okay? So does stress cause cancer? We'll never know. We will never know that, and the reason is we can't take half this room and put them under a stressful situation and the other half and put them in a non-stressful situation and then follow them out 20 years and see what happens, okay? But we can say for sure that cancer, stress causes cancer progression and we can say for sure that treatment of that stress causes cancer reduction. So, these poor mice were inoculated with melanoma in their paws, okay? Then half the mice were exposed to 14 days of stress regime, including periods of food deprivation, 45 degree cage tilt, soiled cage, low intensity strobe light, overnight elimination, removed bedding, and noise emitted from a radio. Poor mice, right? So, I, and I wanna, I wanna tell you guys that I put all my resources at the bottom of the slide presentation. So if you wanna read these articles, I only use peer-reviewed journals for these articles. So if you wanna read these articles, you, you, could, you're, it, you can do so. So I say it's like a club, right? Strobe light, no food, you know, overnight. The only thing that's missing is a 45 degree head tilt. I mean, I guess it's like a head tilt, not cage tilt, right? 
So imagine they were seven days with this prior to the inoculation of the melanoma and then seven days afterwards. And these, these are their paws with the, um, you can see, with the melanoma. And what they found that the red arm is the stressed out arm and the dark blue arm is the non-stressed out arm. They found out that within two to three days, the melanoma in the stressed out arm grew rapidly. In the non-stressed out arm, it was about 10 days before they really saw any sign of melanoma growing. This is another study. These mice, again, poor mice, were placed in a restraint system, okay? So they couldn't, these two mice on the end somehow managed to turn around, but they couldn't get back, right? But they were placed in a restraint system for two hours and six hours. And then they had already been inoculated with ovarian cancer or breast cancer, okay? And what we find is that the two hours or six hours didn't matter. Two hours was enough to cause a difference. If you compare the control arms to the daily stress arm of two hours, their tumors doubled. This is tumor weight on this left-hand thing. This is number of nodules, and you can see the number of nodules are markedly more. We're talking 10 nodules versus three nodules in a stressed out arm. And then what they did is they took the same mice and put them in a control group where they had a, a rat park, a mice park. They had things to play with, wheels to play with. They had their friends and family and babies around them. And then they put them in social isolation. No wheels, nobody to play with, nobody. And they're just in alone in the cage. And again, again, tumor doubled and tripled in size in the, in the mice in social isolation. So what is the first thing we do when we have a cancer diagnosis, right? Socially isolate ourselves, correct? So this is evidence, physical evidence that yes, going out with your friends makes you feel better. Yes, coming to church makes you feel better. Yes, controlling your stress makes you feel better. But at a molecular level, we're talking about changing cancer outcomes, okay? So what about treating stress? So this is 227 patients treated for breast cancer. Half were randomized to psychological intervention arm, half to regular assessment. The intervention arm had strategies to reduce stress, improve moods, and health behaviors. This is the curve. The top line is the intervention arm. Notice the space between the curves, right? The top line is the intervention arm. The bottom line is the is the non-intervention arm. This is the curve that got temozolomide, which is a chemotherapy that I give my patients, approved over radiation therapy. This is the curve that group therapy did in breast cancer patients. Now, a statistician in the room, are there any statisticians before I? If, if you're a statistician, you're saying, you can't compare those two curves. I mean, different numbers, different percentages, you can't do that. I'm not saying that I'm going to compare the two curves. I just want you to think that this drug was fast-tracked through the FDA for approval based on that curve. This is, nobody's ever heard of this study until I present it. Another very similar study, women with stage four breast cancer were randomized to therapy versus no therapy, okay? And the therapy was just group, minute, group therapy weekly for 90 minutes led by a psychiatrist or social worker who themselves had breast cancer in remission. And self-hypnosis was taught for pain control and managing side effects. Okay, you guys are thinking, well, that's nice, and I bet you they felt better about their cancer diagnosis. Well, the intervention arm had a 36-month median or average survival. The, interven the non-intervention group had an 18-month survival, double the survival. Now let me give you some history. We do not have a drug in modern day oncology, at least since the year 2000, um, and maybe only one drug, Gleevec, in the 90s that, uh, that was approved for CML that has doubled survival, or even come close to doubling survival. Most drugs are approved with a four to five week survival benefit. This is an intervention that doubled survival in breast cancer. So imagine if this was a drug for a minute, right? Imagine if this is a drug. You guys are the FDA, 
I'm presenting this drug. What would happen? So I went to an oncology conference a few years ago, and we have what's called the plenary session, which is where they give the big announcements. And they made an announcement about lung cancer drug that improved survival by two weeks. And people started running out of the room. And I was like, what is going on? I was just a fellow. I didn't know what was going on. And somebody says, oh, those are all the people from Wall Street. Because they're running out of the room to buy, right? So if, this, if I presented this at that meeting, I mean, the room would be empty, right? Like, you know, you'd all be buying the stock. It would be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. But has anybody ever heard of this study? No, right? So this is the non-essential organ support group. It says, hi, my name is Appendix, and sometimes I get so angry I could burst. And you have a purpose, maybe, right? So, you know, we make fun in the medical world of psychiatry and psychology and things like that. But we don't realize the actual outcomes that are occurring from that physically. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is exercise. And I have to preface this by saying I don't like exercise. Okay, I force myself to do it. I don't like it. I, it's, my, it's my confession. Uh, Mr. Fremont's here. He's probably like very upset about it. But I, I don't like it. But I force myself to do it. And the reason is, so let's look at exercise in mice. And I first read this article, interestingly enough, in The Economist. And then I went back and found the original article. So this is published in Cellular Metabolism. And this is March of 2016. So this was just last month. I just read this article recently. So these are mice. Half the mice were given a wheel to run on in their, in their cage. The other half were not given a wheel. They injected them with melanoma again. And the control arm, as you can see, is on the left. Those are the tumors in the control arm. And then in the experimental arm, those are the tumors that grew. Again, you can see on this left side, control arm, the, amount, the tumor volume, experimental arm, tumor volume. Exercise caused that much of a difference in their tumor growth. So why does this happen? Wh what, what is the cause of this? We don't know, obviously. But one of the things that these same scientists did, Dr. Hodgman, is she actually went back and removed the beta adrenergic receptors. So the, um, excuse me, she removed the natural killer cells from the mice. So remember the picture I showed you in the beginning, the kiss of death? She removed all those cells. When she removed those cells, she removed them through an antibody. This is the control arm and the intervention arm now, right? The control arm and the intervention arm are exactly the same. So we think that exercise works through stimulation of our natural killer cells and an immune-mediated mechanism. And um, we're not for sure, this is, this is again, this is published March of 2016, so this is some new data out there, um, but that may be the mechanism. So in recurrent glioma patients, if you had brisk walking for 30 minutes on five days a week, no matter how good a shape you were in, number, number of prior progressions, again, we saw a significant survival benefit. 13 months versus 22 months. And this is recurrent glioma patients. So we don't have anything that in recurrent glioma patients that can give you that kind of survival benefit. So why don't we know about this? This is published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, one of our premier journals. But nobody, when I presented this at our grand rounds, nobody had ever heard of this study. Again, looking at lymphoma, prospective trial looking at exercise three times a week for 15 to 45 me minutes with lymphoma. Imagine, 15 minutes three times a week. That's it, okay, up to 45 minutes. Exercise group, 69%. Control group, 59% five-year survival. But the interesting thing, the reason I bring this study up, because I can show you study after study with different cancers. The reason I bring this up, study up, the every single group had a benefit, except for the people who did not exercise at all. So even the people who had less, that red line, who had less than 80% adherence, they couldn't even exercise 15 minutes three times a week. Even the people who had less than 80% adherence had a benefit. 
right? Crazy. I mean, that's, that's nothing. And they considered exercise walking. This, on the left-hand side, is the curve that got our CHOP approved. Rituximab is a drug that we refer to as vitamin R because it's a chemotherapy that we use in all lymphomas, okay? This is the difference between our CHOP and CHOP without the rituximab. This is the exercise again. Now again, you can't compare these. If you're a statistician, you're saying you can't compare these different numbers, different percentages. I'm just saying exercise 15 minutes three times a week caused this difference and that's what got rituximab approved. Again, FDA fast-tracked everything like that, okay? So exercise is important. It changes your cancer at a molecular level. Stress reduction is important. Changes your cancer at a molecular level. What about nutrition, right? That's what we're all here to hear. Here to hear. So, so Thomas Edison said, the doctor of the future will give no medication, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. So the problem with diet is randomized double-blinded controlled trials are virtually impossible to do. I'm going to show you some, but they're very, very difficult to do, especially in the United States. So the only trial you can do is a prospective cohort, which is very difficult to do. So Dr. Colin Campbell, does everybody know who he is? Because I think most people in this room do know who he is. Can you raise your hands so I can see if that, okay. So I will go through, Dr. Campbell is a friend and mentor of mine. He's, a, he's the star of Forks Over Knives, right? And um, he's a wonderful, humble man. And the reason I first approached him to come to Cincinnati a couple of years ago was because I was so interested in how he used science to talk to people, not, you know, anecdotal evidence, what we call patient. I have this one patient. I had this one patient. So his original research, he used aflatoxin. And he randomized or put the mice on a 20% casein diet versus a 5% casein diet. And what he found, this is his slide, what he found was that the number of early cancer clusters went up as the animal-based protein went up. So casein is a milk protein. And as the, an, as the casein went up, the number of early cancer clusters went up. So aflatoxin at that time was the most potent carcinogen he could find. Now we have many more. But to see that big of a difference was very impressive. Then he would turn on and turn off the cancer by giving them different percentages of casein. And he found that he could turn on and turn off cancer. It was, it was astounding work. I mean, he was, he, and for those of you who have seen the movie, I mean, he was a dairy farmer, grew up on a dairy farm. So this, to him, was counterintuitive. So then he wrote the China study. And what is the China study? Study, for those of you who haven't seen it or read the book, is a partnership between Cornell University, Oxford University, and the Chinese Academy of Preventative Medicine. And it's, it's, what happened is they studied mortality rates in China between 1973 and 1975 in 65 counties. And I asked him, I'm like, are you sure? How did you get the mortality rates? Well, it was a communist country. They had complete control. The people who they didn't know how they died, they had autopsies, all of them. So they knew about, to, he said, to 97, 98% basically how everybody died. Then he went to China and correlated them with dietary surveys between 1983 and 1984. So that included 367 variables, 6,500 adults, more than 8,000 statistically significant associations. So this is what 6,500 people looks like. It's, it's a big number. This is the UAE flag. They're making the UAE flag. So the China study has been called the Grand Prix of all epidemiologic studies by the New York Times. Today, AICR, the American Institute for Cancer Research, advocates a predominantly plant-based diet for lower cancer risk because of the great work Dr. Campbell began 25 years ago, Marilyn Gentry, president of AICR. The China study is a well-documented analysis of the fallacies of the modern diet. The lessons from China provide compelling rationale 
for a plant-based diet to promote health and reduce the dis diseases of affluence. Sushma Palmer, Executive Director, Director of Food and Nutrition Board, U.S. National Academy of Sciences. And former B President Bill Clinton is plant-based, lost 24 pounds, singles out the China study and Dr. Campbell as leaders in his movement. Whole food plant-based diet is the best diet for promoting an overall healthy lifestyle. Prevents cancer, turns off tumor genesis, decreases cholesterol and heart disease, Plants are antioxidants that aid in the fight against cancer. So, has anybody read this book, The Blue Zones? Right? Very, very interesting book. Um, it's not as scientific as I would have liked it to be, but it talks about people in five different areas. Okinawa, Japan, Ikaria, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Loma Linda, California, and Nicoya, Costa Rica, Costa Rica, that have high percentage of people who live over the age of 100. And what did they what did they find? Well, you might be thinking at this moment, Loma Linda, California? Like why? What's what's going on in Loma Linda, right? Well, we have the Adventists, Seventh day Adventists there, who consider their body their church. And a great majority of them are vegetarian. And they also exercise, they don't smoke, and they have very few vices. So they have a study that's ongoing and it has ninety six thousand people in it. So this is what about 100,000 people look like, right? Go Bucks, right? This is Ohio State Stadium, almost completely filled, 100,000 people. Much bigger than the 6,500 we saw before from Dr. Campbell's work. So what they found, 8% reduction in overall cancer, 23% reduction in GI cancers, 35% reduction in colon cancer, 45% reduction in prostate cancer with a vegetarian diet. Just not, not a vegan diet, not a whole food plant-based diet, but a vegetarian diet. Then came along the EPIC study, the European Prospective Investigation in Cancer. It says 23 centers, 10 European countries, healthy subjects re recruited between 1992 and 2000, 448,568 studies, so subjects. Huge study. This is the hugest study I've ever seen with diet and cancer. So this is 500,000 people. This is the 1991 protest of the communist government. So look at this. This is 500,000 people, 6,500 people, 100,000 people, 500,000 people. Imagine the power of this study. Huge, huge, huge study. What they found so far, now remember, what did I say about prospective studies? You have to follow people for years and years and years before you see a difference, right? A real meaningful difference. Because we're taking these healthy subjects and we have to follow them out 20 years, okay? What they did find so far, and this is published in 2010, we haven't gotten any more recent updates, although... The, uh, does anybody remember the WHO recommendation that eating processed meat is as dangerous as smoking? Right. So that came from the EPIC study. That's, that's data from that. So lung cancer, 40% reduction with fruit intake. Breast cancer, 13% increase with saturated fat intake. And increased BMI was a significant predictor for breast cancer. Prostate cancer was high consumption of dairy and calcium leads to increased risk. Gastric cancer found increased with total meat, red meat, and processed meat, decreased with cereal fiber, 33% reduction in gastric cancer with a Mediterranean diet, and we're going to talk about that more. Colorectal cancer, 42% reduction in patients with high dietary fiber from cereal, 35% increase with red meat and processed meat, 8% increase with more than 15 grams of alcohol a day. For you, that's 1.5 standard drinks, okay? And this is the process. Processed meat has been the main, the main thing that's come out of that. And as you can see, this is the risk in terms of 1.3 times, 1.4 times, 1.5 times, 2, 2 times, 2.4 times on the left-hand side. And on the x-axis is the processed meat consumption predicted daily. So we're talking, if you're eating like 180 grams daily, you're almost two times the risk of cancer with processed meat. Now, I had a discussion the other day with uh, a friend of mine, I'm doing some work with a ketogenic diet, which is different from a plant-based diet, but I'm doing it in a very select group of patients. And I had, a, pa I had a, a friend, a colleague, who is very interested in diet and cancer. 
And he says to me, I don't believe that study. He doesn't believe a study of 500,000 people. Why? Because he says, and I, and I, and I, I get what he's saying. He says the people who are eating processed meat are also the people who are drinking heavily. They're the people who are not exercising. They're the people who are not, not walking to work. They're not, they're probably lower socioeconomic status. They're eating very bad processed meat. You cannot draw that conclusion from that study of 500,000 people. Okay? So this is what I'm up against in trying to convince my colleagues that diet can make a difference in cancer. So this is the most exciting study that has come out, and I talked about how difficult it is to do randomized control data, okay, with diet. This is a randomized control trial, okay? It's published in JAMA, which JAMA is one of our, again, premier journals. September 2015, you can pull it. Um, the, the primary author is easy to remember. It's Toledo. It's a Spanish trial. Only could, we could only do this trial in Europe because we don't, because we have so much private um, practices that don't put people on clinical trials. Everybody goes on a clinical trial in Europe. So October 2003 to June 2009, so very recent, 7,447 people they put on this trial. Amazing, amazing, okay? They randomized them to Mediterranean diet plus olive oil, Mediterranean diet plus nuts, plus nuts and a control diet, a low-fat diet. Now, the problem is, immediately you should say, for my stress lecture, right, the people that were getting more attention are going to do better. So they realized that within a few months of doing the trial, and they started giving attention to the low-fat people too. So they would have cooking classes with them and to make them feel better, so because they didn't want the diet, the, the results to be skewed. Okay, so what is the Mediterranean diet? The Mediterranean diet is fruits, vegetables, grains, beans, legumes, basically a plant-based diet with some small um, fishes, fish like salmon, very little poultry, eggs, cheese, yogurt, meat, sweets, wine in moderation, and water. So it's basically a plant-based diet. It's like an 80-20 diet, okay? This is what they found. Now we're going backwards now. that We want the curves to go up because we're looking at incidence of breast cancer is what we're looking at. So new breast cancer to cases since 2009. Patients, the last patient was enrolled on this trial in 2009. Okay, so keep that in mind. This is only seven years old or six years old when this was published. So 62% decrease in breast cancer incidence compared to the low-fat arm. What if I told you you have a history of breast cancer, and there's a drug out there that is going to decrease your risk by 62%. Would you want that drug? Would that drug be the most expensive drug on the market? Would that drug, would that drug company be taking me out to dinner? They used to do that. They don't do that anymore. But would they, would they, would they take me out to dinner and rent out Universal Studios? They used to do that too. You know, would they, would they do all those things? Yes. Yes. But this is just a diet with olive oil, Mediterranean diet with olive oil. Look at the p-value. What was the p-value? Does anybody remember? This is a st statistically significant number. This didn't happen by chance. This happened by the intervention. 0 0.02 is the p-value. I mean, to me, I presented this at um, I presented this at my hematology oncology grand rounds. I was so nervous because I knew they were gonna. I know they were gonna choose, and they did. They really gave me a hard time. But one of the one of the people, he's a bone marrow transplanter. He said to me, he said, "Well, what was the number needed to treat? Number needed to treat is a number that we look at in statistics and studies when you have to treat, let's say, a hundred patients." So how many people do you need to treat to save 100 lives, for instance? So if you treat 100 patients and you save 95 lives, that's worth it, right? It's worth the, it's worth the toxicity of the chemotherapy. If you treat 100 patients and you only save 5 lives, people are going to say that's not worth the toxicity of that chemotherapy. So he asked, what is the number needed to treat? And I said, why are you asking that question in relevance to this study? 
This is not talking about a toxic chemotherapy. This is not talking about a surgery. It's not talking about a radiation therapy. It's talking about eating whole grains and eating some fruits and vegetables with a little bit of olive oil drizzled on top. That number is not pertinent in this study. Now, that's how much resistance, even though I presented a randomized double-blinded control trial, not double-blinded, a randomized control trial to him of 7,000 patients, people were very resistant. The one thing I want to bring up before we talk about other things is omega-3 before versus omega-6. How many people have heard about this recently? Um, Dr. Greger, I don't know if anybody's read his book, um, How Not to Die. So he's, he's big into this, and it's very interesting. This came up because there are still vegetarians dying early of heart disease. I mean, uh, the Indian population is rampant with heart disease, and many of them are vegetarian. So what, why is this happening? And they think it's because of the omega-6, omega-3 ratio. So omega-6 is bad. Um, nuts that are high in fat, butter, things like that, produce pro-inflammatory. Omega-3s, we need a good ratio. You still need omega-6s, but you need them in a ratio that is good. So we tend to get a lot of omega-6 and not a lot of omega-3. Omega-3 are fish, salmon, flaxseed, and chia seeds. Okay, is a big part of the vegetarian or vegan diet with that. But the reason I bring this up is because I just found this study. And how did I find this one? I don't even know how I found it. But I was just amazed. So another example of dietary intervention working better than drugs. Okay. So they took 32 women. This is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. Again, this is 32 women. So different than the 7,000 women, right? So it's a small study. The women had a biopsy for, of their breast. And then they were given a flaxseed muffin with 25 grams of flaxseed. That's it. And they were given it in a, a foil container, right? So nobody could know. The doctor didn't know who was getting the flaxseed muffin. The patient didn't know until they got home. And then they didn't know what the other people were getting. And then the other half of them, they just gave them a muffin without flaxseed. And then three to 14 days later, they had their lumpectomy, where they took out the actual mass. And then they looked at the differences in the patients. Now, KI-67, I'm not going to get try to get too technical here. KI-67 is a measure of cell turnover. So if your percentage case, KI-67 in breast cancer is less than 7%, you can see you have almost 100%, maybe 95% survival at 100 months. If you have, sorry, I'm going to use my hands here. If you have a KI-67 greater than 20%, that means your cells are rapidly de developing, de uh, turning over, your survival drops closer to 50%. So KI-67, a very important predictor of survival in breast cancer. So this is the control arm on the left, and the top bar is the KI-67. Look at the p-value for the flaxseed muffin arm. 0 0.001. What was the p-value? 0.05. This is so statistically significant. This only could happen by chance 0.001% of the time, right? So they had a difference. They had a decrease in their KI-67 from a flaxseed muffin for 10 days, okay? Then they looked at apoptosis. Has anybody heard this term before? So apoptosis is programmed cell death. It's what our body does naturally. And this is a cool picture. I love this picture. This is a cancer cell kind of exploding, dying, electron microscope. KI-67, this p-value, 0 0.007. Increased cell death with the flaxseed muffin. No change in the control arm. In fact, the p-value is 1 in the control arm. No change, right? Once again... I bring up the concept that a small dietary manipulation of omega-3s could change the breast tissue in 3 to 14 days. These are the same changes that we see with tamoxifen. Okay? So, I mean, when I present this, I have not presented this. I'm presenting this at Medicine Grand Rounds May 11th. We'll see. We'll see what people 
can say to this, published in Clinical Cancer Research, which is the main cancer research journal that we have. So you need everything is what basically what I'm saying. So why incorporate it into your daily life? I hope I've convinced you that it works on every level. But I'm going to leave you with one last study. I know you guys are sick of this, but this is what I do all day, and this is how I'm going to have to convince you. 93 patients with low-risk prostate cancer were on a wait-and-watch treatment. They were randomized, again, a randomized trial, to a control arm and a lifestyle arm. The lifestyle arm was a low-fat, plant-based diet, exercise, and practice stress management. And they attended group support sessions. This is by Dr. Dean Ornish, who's one of a, we're trying to get him to come to Cincinnati to speak, but th that would be amazing. Two years, 27% of the control arm required surgery, 5% of the experimental arm. 27%, a third of the patients went on to require surgery, only 5% of the experimental arm. Five times the amount. Okay? But he didn't just stop there. What he did, as you looked at telomere length. How many people have heard of telomere length? Oh my gosh, you guys are a smart audience. So telomeres are like shoelaces, okay, on the end of our chromosomes. So you know the caps on shoelaces? If you don't have the caps on them, they tend to fray. Well, telomeres are like those caps, and they keep our chromosomes steady and young. So telomere shortening is associated with disease risk, premature death, and obviously increased cancer risk, okay? So he looked at the lifestyle intervention group, and he looked at the control group. The control group continued to age. They continued, their, their cells continued to get older. The lifestyle intervention group, their telomere length increased. Again, p-value, 0 0.004. Very, very significant study, and change at a molecular level. Then he looked at the people who were most compliant. So average relative telomere length increased by 0 0.07 for every percentage point increase in healthy living regimen adherence score. So he looked at the, pa the patients who had adherence to it, and he found that an increase in the relative telomere length. So if, the stricter you were, the more your telomeres increased, the more fountain of youth. Okay, so I'm, I'm a big Oprah fan, I know. I love Oprah. So I got to meet her. And this is me with Oprah. Uh, my hair was a little longer. It really is me. And the one thing that she talked about, she's amazing in person, by the way. One thing she talked about was choosing love, not fear. So why do we get mad at our kids? Right? We're scared. Right? We're really scared that they're going to turn out badly and then, you know, we're not, they're not going to, they're not going to be good human beings. Right? Why do we yell at our husbands? I yell at my husband. Why do I yell at my husband? Because I'm scared of something. I'm scared that he's going to embarrass me. I'm scared that, you know, I mean, something we often don't, the reason we get angry and agitated is because we're scared. So I always thought the opposite of love was, was hate, but it's not. It's really fear. So what people say, why should I do this? You know, I said, you can't look at it. You can't do it out of fear. Because if you do it out of fear, it defeats the whole purpose. And I, th I think that's easy for me to say. For I know there's some cancer patients in the room, and I think that's easy for me to say. But I started doing this out of fear because um, I was scared. And now I, I do it because I want to live this spa-like lifestyle. I want to have, like, the salad. I want to look like her and maybe not like her. You know what I mean? I don't want to have this, this, this urgency and this need and this fear. I want to do it because I want to live this luxurious life. One final study, I swear. I swear to goodness. You guys, you guys do. Optimism. So they took 10,000 people in Minnesota, and they had them take the MMPI. How many people have taken the MMPI for a business job interview or something? It's a personality index. And they looked, they divided them into pessimists and optimists. 20 years later, 18 years later, 534 of those patients developed lung cancer. They were smokers. They developed lung cancer. They looked at the patients 20 years later who were pessimists and optimists. Look at the curve. The non-pessimists, I think they should have called that optimists, the non-pessimists lived longer 
Look at the p-value, 0.01. The top line is the optimist, the bottom line is a pessimist. So my boss, the division chief, says, well, that's positive because the optimists are going to be more aggressive about their chemotherapy. I don't care. I don't care why it's positive. The point is, it's positive. So all of you who came here today, by definition, are optimists, right? By definition, the fact that you think you can have control over your life is optimism. So you're already on that top curve. You're already less than 0 0.05 of the population. This is the walk for the cure that we do every year for brain tumor patients. And I like this quote, hope is the seed of breakthrough. If you have hope, then breakthrough is inevitable. Um, brain tumor patients, to me, are one of the most inspiring patients I've ever taken care of. You think that you have a brain tumor and you can't live life. You can't go out. You can't exercise. You can't do that. And they all do it. And they do it faster than I do it. I mean, at this walk, a lot of my patients are running faster than me. They beat me in the 5K. And... It's kind of embarrassing when you're running and then you have a patient who has a brain tumor and they're passing you. Hi, Dr. Chaudhary. I'm like, oh my gosh, just don't, don't acknowledge me, please. You know, so this is, we do this every year and I want to bring this up. I hope it's okay with Preeti. We're having a wine tasting next Thursday. I'm the MC. Somehow I got, I don't know, I did go to one meeting and then I opened the script and it said, hi, I'm Rekha Chaudhary. I'll be your MC for the evening. So I won't be having any wine, but there's a wine tasting and there's invitations out on the front, and I hope you'll support brain tumor research. All the money stays in Cincinnati. It's at the Museum Union, uh, the Museum Union Center, and it's right before it closes down for all the renovations. For you guys all to know, we have written up that the data from the Plant Nation movie, and it's being presented at the ACP meeting in April, I think the end of this month, and at, as well as at UC Grand Rounds um, at the at the University grand round poster presentation. So we're working on getting that data out, published, and presented. This is great. Thank you so much, Dr. Chaudhary. And there's a thought. <laughs>